So I did a survey recently on my channel. The survey had to do with what kind of videos do you want to see? And there were four options. One of them was doing a kind of a fast speed video and then doing commentary behind it. So I'm not going to bother, bother, bother with going through the process and all that stuff. I'm going to actually talk behind this video. This is a tub to shower conversion, which I do pretty frequently and it is standard builder's grade 4x4 tile been up here for a good part of 20 years blah 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 well i totally totally messed up on this part uh the demo part of this uh tub to shower conversion uh the demo part is relatively easy it usually takes me about two hours on a normal type of situation like this and so my two hour video of this demo didn't turn out right because I wasn't or I don't know I didn't go ahead and review the video after I did the tear out and even if I had the tear out was already done uh, so the problem became that I had a head strap with my GoPro on it and had it tilted in such a way that didn't show all the stuff I wanted to show all right so you guys saw the crappy way that I filmed the tear out portion of this uh, tub to shower conversion it really was crappy. I, so I had a GoPro head strap and I could not see exactly where I was pointed at, which is why it turned out crappy. But yeah, the tub and all that stuff, all the tear out, the cutting of the lines, all that stuff was not filmed and I apologize for that. I'll get better as I go along. I did manage though, however, to get this portion down pretty, pretty succinctly, I think. Um, after the tear out, which you saw kind of crappily, um, I begin the build back process. And I start with the niche, almost always. So kind of I move from the carpentry phase to the plumbing phase and then uh, the build back, the prep part proper. Um, the niche is built with two by fours. I usually do it on the rear wall, meaning the longest wall. Um, in this case, I'm doing it on the back wall opposite the shower head. That's where the customer wanted it. And I do um, the cutout of the stud in between. And a lot of people will feel like it needs a king and a jack and a uh, header and all that stuff, um, especially on that rear wall or the back wall rather, because it's usually a load bearing exterior wall. But I have talked to framers and they said that, yeah, there's no harm, no foul for one stud like that. Um, as I put the, the lateral, the horizontal studs in between, um, then I kind of figure out the math on the vertical studs that I'm hammering in right now and leveling out to find out uh, what size they're going to be. I usually try and get it mm, somewhat center, and I think I accomplished that here. But um, I'm using different levels because I think this was shorter, ended up being shorter than my two foot level that you saw earlier. So I kind of cross check with these other little cruddy levels that I've had for a while, these one foot levels. And then I'm using three inch deck screws. Sometimes I use a framing nailer, uh, but I got to set up the compressor and the hose and all that stuff. So in this case, it was a condo and I didn't want to drag all that stuff in. So I'm using uh, deck screws on this. Um, and I'm constantly checking level and I'm constantly making sure that everything um, is going to be the same size. So I do a measurement usually top and bottom, left to right, make sure that that's exactly within, you know, a sixteenth of an inch or so. And I do the same thing from top to bottom um, to make sure that that's also because I, you know, I just want it as good as possible. There's some manipulation with that niche later on with the thin set and the tile. But the prep matters because I know I'm going to be tiling it, so I'm trying to get it down as good as I can. What I'm doing here is I'm getting ready to do the blocking between the studs at the bottom for the pan liner to rest up against. 
and I ran into a pipe. I think it was a um, stack, and so I'm just notching out this 2x6 so I can fashion it in around where that pipe is at. The blocking, um, I'm going to say it's necessary. I started doing it when I started doing showers because I never saw it before, so I kind of integrated it into my work and um, it just kind of has it gives somewhere for your pan liner to rest up against and that's why i do the blocking and i usually try and get it pretty tight as you can tell here uh 16th or so over what the measurement is so that it, it fits in there really well and then i do the toenail um, fasteners left and right on the top and again sometimes with framing nails and in this case i was doing it with the three inch deck screws when I get to the front portion where the supply line is at, um, I think on this shower, I didn't show it, but on this shower, I actually used some plywood. No, I didn't show it on here, but um, unfortunately on the video, I missed that part. But where those lines were that I was just touching, there's only maybe on that bottom uh, two by four, there's maybe a half an inch and so yeah i just take some plywood and i glue it in same as i'm gluing in this piece here which i'm gluing in that piece because um there's nowhere on the left side you see that pipe there there's nowhere on this left side to anchor it so i'm so it's anchored toenailed on the right but now i'm gluing in something to support it in the back and then i put some shims in it too to kind of bump it out and get it flush with that bottom plate and then on the left side there later on i'm using some plywood and i kind of do the same thing i glue all three sides left right bottom uh, with some um, construction adhesive and that sets it in there good enough and I, I do that frequently because some of the sometimes that pipe is so close to the front um, that it's you really can't do it any other way you know quarter inch or half inch ply three eighths ply the carpentry portion as i said i usually knock out first and this is another phase of that um, when you cut out the, the old wall and the tile and all that stuff inevitably you end up with a gap uh, between the stud and the sheetrock so yeah theoretically you could cut back the sheetrock another you know inch or two inches or whatever and fashion the stud in there sideways a two by four but what i usually do is what i'm doing here which is a one by four because it fits in there relatively easy sometimes you kind of lose it inside of the wall like I just did there and then you have to fish it out but I always have a screw um, screwed into the bottom of that and then I just kind of dig it back out and I line it up flush with that 2x4 on the right side and then I run a bunch of screws into the sheetrock and into the 1x4 that way it's stable and it's anchored to that sheetrock so when i put my wallboard to you know kind of marry up to that existing wallboard um, not only are they flush but i have something solid to um, to then screw the wallboard into and it makes it really easy peasy where you don't have to cut out xf sheetrock that's not necessary i think this was an eight foot piece that i had to cut down to less than six foot and put the larger piece up on the top and then I think I had about another foot left um, that I had to put down at the bottom because I wanted that raised up uh, that piece raised up that I'm touching there uh, about four or five inches past that top of the stud so that when I come in with my screws which I'm doing right there that I have enough of that one by to screw into so I have a, a good solid anchoring of that piece of wood And then I think I kind of jump over to the curb at this point. Um, yeah, I'm still fashioning in that piece, trying to find one that'll fit, and then cutting off the excess. Um, oh God, that 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 tool right there, which I just by default call a Dremel, and of course there's many manufacturers. That's probably one of my favorite and most useful tools in this business. It does so much work for me. You know, just quick cuts like that. I can use it to undercut door jams when I'm doing floor tile. I can use it to cut pipe. I mean, it's just, it's multifunctional and, and probably my most used tool besides my uh, screw gun.
Um, but getting on to the curb, uh, there's no way I can center my drain and my um, do my plumbing work and all that stuff without having done that. So I'm going to move on to that later, but I think I'm getting into the plumbing next. I think I'm getting into cutting out the old valve. And I believe on this job, my customer wanted to learn how to sweat pipe because I think I'm one of the anomaly guys out there that still <laughs> sweat pipe that don't, haven't moved over to PEX. Um, this tool here is awesome. Uh, I think it's a Husky brand, but you just keep on turning and turning and turning it. It clamps on, you know, it's got one opening, it clamps on. You just keep turning it until, you know, the pipe um, is fully cut. A lot better than the than you know the turn the bottom. Uh, well, a lot of people that do copper will know what I'm talking about. Those old-fashioned ones where you turn the bottom, then twist the tool, and then turn the bottom and twist the tool. No, this one's much much better. Makes a uh, fast work of getting out all the plumbing you don't need. Um, anytime you work with water, shut down the water. It should go without saying, but I have to say it anyway. I always shut down the water, um, make sure that I don't have any issues with um, a pipe exploding in my customer's house. Um, I'm cleaning off, I'm just sanding off the ends because I know I'm going to be attaching connectors right there. That's not where my valve is going to go, it's going to go right there. And so that's where I cut it. I cut it exactly where I'm going to need it for the new valve going up that uh, stand pipe to the shower head. And so I'm just doing all of the prep work right now because I'm, I'm going to eventually dry fit all that copper um, before I ever get to the point of sweating the pipe. So all my 90s, all my connectors, all of that stuff, including my uh, valve itself, um, gets all prepped and sanded and get some flux on it. Do all my measurements, all my cutting, and all that stuff. And there's my, my customer standing behind me trying to learn how to do all this stuff uh, so yeah there's a mud cap on there that green plastic thing that's a mud cap and I'm gonna get into that in just a second um, also you're gonna take out the uh, cartridge that has to do with that brass body of that valve um, that cartridge is plastic and rubber and there I'm gonna pull it out with some channel locks set that aside that doesn't go back in until everything's sweated because you will melt that and not have a good day. Right, so that, that brass valve, uh, because it's brass, I always start my sweating. I'll get I'll get to that little uh, talk once once I get my torch out and all that stuff. Um, but you wanna you wanna start from the bottom. Wherever your furthest point is with sweating pipe start from that end because by the time you get to that brass valve it lead, it needs a lot more heat than than does copper so you're kind of almost preheating uh, that brass valve by the time you get there um, with your fire so yeah it just makes life a lot easier and then I'm just cutting off uh, the ex extra pipe that I need to bring those uh, hot and cold lines up also I tend to over sweat because having been in the apartment business years ago and having to shut down a building just to make a repair or change out a valve or something like that, you find out that you have a, a very small pinhole leak. You turn the whole building back on and then you realize, uh oh, I got a pinhole leak and then you got to shut the building down. It's a big pain. So what I started doing by default many years ago is I over sweat. Yes, I use much more solder than I need to and it looks sloppy and I don't care. Uh, a lot of plumbers who do it on a day-to-day -day basis know exactly how much uh, how much that they need and they make it very clean and they rub it off with you know a little scouring pad and make it nice and pretty and then you put wallboard on it and you'll never see it <laughs> so I'm more of the practical side of it just making sure making sure making sure that I don't have any issues when I turn the water back on so I'm just applying flux to all of my sanded pieces and the flux um, makes it possible for when you put the heat on the pipe, uh, it kind of cleans the pipe, but also makes it possible for all of that um, solder to kind of get sucked into the area that you want it sucked into. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about briefly before uh, I fire up my torch 
I'm going to talk briefly about that mud cap, and I'll get to that too because that's coming up here pretty soon. Uh, the mud cap is an integral part of your shower valve system, and it comes in the box. Don't throw that plastic part away because that's going to, it will be your parameter on your finished wall. Mm, I think most of them allow for about an inch. I think they're about an inch thick or so. So you have some play room from the very back of that mud cap to the very front, but ultimately your finished wall should meet up with the front or the back of that mud cap, and that's why you don't throw it away. It, it serves that purpose as well as protecting you know, your valve body and all that stuff as you're working. So yeah, I'm just, I'm actually anchoring the pipe down. I got a little piece of scrap um, wood and I just stuck it in that hole where that pipe comes out of the ground so that it's anchored very well. Don't use anything else but wood because you will mess up that pipe. And here's where I fire up the torch. You're actually heating um, the connector. Right in the center of the connector, you're not heating up and down where the pipe is at. Because you want that heat, you want the solder to travel to the heat. So therefore, that's where it goes. And I'm usually doing the bottom part first and then the top part. And um, as I said, oh, I've got a flashlight and a mirror. Yeah, because I always want to, always, 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 always want to check all my connections. And I think a little bit later you're going to see on that 90 to the right that I have to re-sweat. I have to re-sand and sweat because I'm not... I wasn't comfortable there was a hole showing or something like that I wasn't comfortable with it but you see how I started from the bottom work my way up to those 90s I'm putting heat squarely on the elbow of that 90 and letting the solder kind of get sucked in to those directions and by that time now I can go to the valve proper because it's preheated and it makes life easier to uh, to have that preheat thing going on because copper is obviously harder to heat up than, or sorry, brass is harder to heat up. And there's a flashlight in the mirror again, checking all my connections. And I think this is where I saw a suspect hole, which I wasn't sure about. So what I did is I sanded it off a little bit, added a little bit more flux to it, and then went ahead and fired up the torch and took care of that. And, of course, when I turned on the water, I didn't have any leaks, which 99.9% .9 of the time I never do. But, yeah, it's a pain in the ass to shut down. And this is a condo, so it would have required, you know, potentially shutting down, you know, maybe six units or eight units and inconvenience a lot of people. So an hour and a half or so later, you see I'm putting in the cartridge again. Um, you could sponge it off. You could put some water on it. Um, there's a lot of ways you can do that. Also, um, you notice I got a little burn mark on the drywall there, as well as the wood down at the bottom that I'm going to eventually take off anyway, because that's for anchoring. Oh, I'm explaining to my customer the inside portion and the outside portion of that mud cap and why it's there and why you need it. But yeah, I carry a piece of scrap um, metal that I think I took off of some type of an appliance and I carry that in my truck so that I'm not having burn marks and stuff like that going on that you just saw and I always do my sweating first thing in the day as you see I started back behind me with the niche built that out you know kind of moved on from there and then I got to the sweating part so it's the first hour or two of my day I don't want to sweat pipe at the end of the day I don't want to be thinking overnight whether or not, you know, like the house is burnt down, whether or not there's an ember or I heated, I don't know, I heated up something that I shouldn't have. So, yeah, that's kind of the whole plumbing part of the valve. Not much more I can tell you on that except that I'm doing the anchoring now. They have uh, copper straps that I'm screwing into that piece of 2x4 that I stuck in there that you saw the other piece of 2x4 was also an anchoring piece of wood that I ended up taking out so when you're doing your anchoring you've also measured uh, the distance sideways you know you put a scrap piece of sheetrock up to that mud cap there and know that okay I've got half an inch of sheetrock and then I've got another 3 8 tile a little bit of thin set and there I'm marking and making sure that my mud cap is sticking out far enough to accommodate the backer board and the tile. So 
Now I'm getting ready to uh, fashion the curb in, the first piece of the curb, as it were, because that's the only way I can ascertain where my drain is going to go, because I want my drain as center as possible. So I'm making sure left and right the measurement is correct. If it's 32 and a quarter on one end, I want it 32 and a quarter on the other end. Um, and then I mark it because as I screw it down from one end to the other, it might move. So a little pencil mark there, a little pencil mark there. And then I can toenail some of those deck screws into, um, into the, the board that's adjoining. Same thing over here, toenail into that board. And I always do that with all three because I've seen curves that were not anchored in that fashion. And for all intents and purposes, they're not anchored. You know, they're only anchored to the floor so they can move back and forth, you know, front and, front and back. Um, and so I'm adamant about anchoring them um, as many times as possible. I think I use eight screws. I think there's two, I think ten screws. Two on each side and then uh, a couple of uh, screws may be five six inches apart all the way across make sure you have level which it is double check that by the second double check that by the third now the only exception to that is if you decide that you want and your curb should be uh, sloped inward so that when your tile is finally put on that the water sheds off of your curb into the shower so some people like to put some uh, shims in the front side of that curb before they screw it down. Maybe about four or five or six shims to kind of give you a little bit of a, of a slope going on, uh, going into your shower. Um, I don't do it that way. I actually uh, slope with my tile, but there's a hint. This is another one too. Um, that 2x4 was warped. And it was warped in such a way the only thing I could do was like put that 2x4 there and then put like as many tools as I could to kind of push that, which is pushing on the top of that curb so that I could anchor that top piece down. And I'm just shoving everything inside of there that I can. Now that the warp is gone, I can run some screws in there and solidly have that second piece of curb top in. And of course, I also toenail that piece as well as this last and third piece. You know, I'm looking at the end. <laughs> you know, the grain of the wood should be facing down. My grandfather taught me that years ago, and I've just always adhered to that. So you have a little circular grain of wood, and I always make sure that circular part's facing down. And then the same thing, toenail right into that scabbing that I have so that you have a solid anchored piece of uh, curb going on. And then of course I put a level on it and all that stuff. So going forward, now that I know that my curb is where it's gonna be, now I can figure out the math on my drain. And I wanna jump ahead to that drain while uh, you see the screwing thing going on. So the drain itself is inch and a half because it was a tub and it's gonna be converted to a shower. So if you can go as far as you can up under um, the subfloor, uh, when you're doing transition. Uh, sometimes you can't, but at the end of the day it doesn't really matter, but the transition should be as far back as possible. And in this case, I was limited with my room. So just off to the right there, where the drain is at, is where I eventually cut, and you'll see that in a minute. Right now I'm just kind of centering up exactly where my drain is going to land. And it's center left to right and front to back. So I'm just drawing out a line because eventually I got to cut out that swath of uh, plywood to make that happen. And then I'm kind of figuring out uh, the cross section of where uh, the flange is going to end up getting an anchor to the floor. Anyway, getting back to that inch and a half um, to a two inch drain, you don't want to put that P-trap um, down where it was. You want to bring it out. You want to bring it out you know, as far as you can, because you want that P-trap directly under your drain. Um, this saw blade was really weak. I need a new saw blade on my skill saw. And it kicked up a lot of smoke. And so you're going to see in a second here, I'm going through the house, opening the doors and all that stuff, because the smoke alarm went off. And that's where my drain is, right where that cross is.
Yeah, this is where I open the door. Front door and back door. Let the wind come through, shut off that smoke alarm, and get back to work. And here is my Dremel tool again. Um, oscillating tool, if you will. So awesome. I love that thing. So I'm cutting out right where the P-trap starts. And you're going to see in a minute where I fashion in and do a dry fit of the new P-trap. And um, as I said before, don't have the P-trap right there. Ideally, you want the P-trap right below um, where your drain is going to be. Yeah, there's excess water in that P-trap. Get rid of that for sure. And that is a weld P-trap, by the way. It's not the screw type. Weld meaning that it's going to be glued in and not screwed. You know, they do have those connectors that you can screw those, and I don't use those. And so once I get the parameter and I know how far out there I'm doing the measurement, that's where the P-trap is going to set. And then eventually um, I'll glue in um, the connector uh, so that's what that is I have in my hand right now that transitions inch and a half to two inch it's called a hub and that hub gets glued in first and then all the rest of the pipe you know I've got a 90 and then a long piece of pipe and then the p-trap is right there where I want it and I didn't show all that gluing process because it's pretty easy right there you see the hole opening I've got two by fours that I'm, my hand is on left right front and back and I screw those in from the top and I bring those two by the longer two by fours back about another three four inches past where you see it on the floor, and then run down my um, oh yeah I'm checking my level on my uh, pipe there make sure I got my quarter inch per foot. Yeah, that's how I get a stable subfloor when I have to do the cutting through the subfloor is that I just put in the scabbing. 2x4, two 2x6, by two by whatever I have on hand. But I run it past about where, past where my knees are at currently. Um, I just feel better about having run it past that. And then I put in the cross sections front and back, and then I'm good to go. And then the next step is just cutting out the holes exactly where my cross was at earlier that you saw. And I get a compass out, and I make this circular um, pencil mark exactly I think it I think that bottom flange is about four and a half inches um, so with that circular uh, pencil mark that I have on there I know now that I can run uh, a couple of holes I think four holes so that it accommodates a sawzall blade and if you had a, uh, a jigsaw I haven't had a jigsaw for years and years and years but if you had one it probably make life easier for you um, by default, I always use the Sawzall wood cutting blade. And this is where I'm actually doing the drilling of the hole. I'm centering up where the drain is going to be first. And there's my compass. I'm doing the measurement. I think, yeah, I think that's four and a half inches from the bolt uh, recess to the bolt recess. It's about four and a half. Or maybe it's five, I forget. And there's my compass. I'm making my mark, making sure that I have the exact um, fit that's going to go on with that bottom flange. Because right there, I'm literally where you saw the P-trap come up. That's the center mark. And then I run a couple of uh, paddle bit. I think that's like uh, probably a half inch paddle bit. And then I just put four holes in there to accommodate the blade and then I cut from hole to hole I have a circle and then I shore up that circle and then I do a taper cut uh, with my sawzall blade because there's a taper on the bottom of that flange there's um, a taper that I want to follow on my wood and so I'll cut a little taper on top of my wood so that it fits in there nice and snug and then there's four holes on that bottom flange where your screws uh, anchor that flange into the wood and then you're pretty much done with that phase of the plumbing so yeah I've talked ahead of what I'm doing so that you'll understand uh, what's going on and then of course I'm dry fitting um, right well, as I said right below there is where my p-trap comes up and I'm dry fitting making sure that uh, that pipe that I stuck in the bottom flange is the exact size I want it 
and then I'm doing the taper cuts with the blade. But yeah, that covers uh, all the carpentry, the building of the niche, uh, the scabbing uh, between everything that you saw. It covers uh, the curb material, so all of that goes first. And I'm doing the plumbing, as you saw earlier, putting in a new valve. Now I'm doing the plumbing as far as the drain goes. And that's basically it, you know, putting the primer on, putting the glue on setting it in there and then uh, gluing on the cap and that's that's all part of it the next phase is going to be all the wallboard and the waterproofing and then pouring the pan itself and that will probably be on the next video I'm trying out not to make these videos extremely long this one's already 30 minutes and I think the tension span fades after 30 minutes so it'll probably be another 30 minute video with the prep portion and I don't believe I filmed the tile portion but if I didn't I'll put that on another video at some point um, or I might marry these videos together have an hour and a half video I don't know put it in the comment section what would you rather would you rather have like these full bill videos uh, one at a time, part one, part two, part three, or do you want to see all parts and pick and choose what part you want to watch? Tell me in the comment section what you would like. So I'm screening out some thin set, you know, where all the wood joins together for no reason whatsoever. Nobody will ever see that. All the boogering up of the plywood I'm doing also. There's no reason for that. I'm doing it because I want it nice and neat, nice and flush and neat and pretty that nobody will ever see yeah I know it's weird you don't need to do it I did it on here I just you know whatever maybe I had time to kill but that's it thanks for watching hey if you enjoyed that video and you learned something consider being a patreon member five ten fifteen dollars a month would help me greatly produce more videos I make nothing up from YouTube at all if you're gonna call me for advice Please donate $50 for 30 minutes. My link to my PayPal and my Patreon account is down below. And if you haven't already, hit the subscribe button and hit the bell so you get immediate notifications as soon as I post a video. And thank you very much for your support.